The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello. Welcome to South Asian Heart Center's webinar series on therapeutic lifestyle changes. My name is Ashish Mathur. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the South Asian Heart Center. I'll be your moderator today. Dr. Molina, who is the medical director and co-founder of the South Asian Heart Center, will present. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions, and the way you would do that is by using the webinar question line. line. You would be able to uh, do that. You can raise your hands. I'll be able to see that. Um, if there are any technical issues, you can send us an email to admin at southasianheartcenter.org. Um, we will have some polls during the webinar, um, maybe two or three of them. Uh, be quick to answer so that we can remove the poll from your screen. And the presentation handout should be available uh, at our website by the end of the week. Also, we are recording this webinar, so you can uh, check out the uh, recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel, SAHC Sati. I wanted to bring you up to speed on um, the issue of heart disease and diabetes in the South Asian population that we at the South Asian Heart Center are trying to address. India has 17% of the world population, yet it carries a disproportionate burden of coronary artery disease uh, and diabetes. 60% um, of the burden uh, of CAD is borne by Indians of South Asian descent. Three out of that makes it every three out of every five people with coronary artery disease is an Indian. And uh, the same holds true literally for diabetes as well. By the year 2030, one out of every two diabetic in the world will be Indian. What we are finding is that um, this issue um, uh, in Indians is happening to people at a younger age. Uh, and also, um, this is in a predominantly vegetarian, non-smoking, and non-obese population. The traditional risk factors for heart disease, uh, uh, heart attacks are occurring in this population at um, earlier ages, 50% before the age of 55, compared to uh, 65 for um, white men in this country. Uh, the population is sicker, two to four times in the incidence of heart disease, two to four times hospitalization, two to four, two, twice the rate of mortality uh, with um, a heart attack and three times the risk of a secondary MI. The question always comes up, why are South Asians at a higher risk? Uh, we see that the risk factors, the traditional risk factors for heart disease occur in this population at an earlier age. Um, we also have a shortage of the protective lifestyle factors, specifically uh, sedentary lifestyles and not having fruits and vegetables in the diet. We are, we are predominantly a grain-based um, uh, diet. We have a predominantly grain-based diet. And finally, there are um, genetic markers that are um, present uh, in this population, such as LP little a or subtypes of LDL and HDL that typically are not tested for, uh, also inflammatory markers, etc. So we created the South Asian Heart Center in 2006 to address this issue um, with our mission to reduce the high incidence of heart disease and diabetes in the South Asian population uh, through a culturally appropriate program. Uh, and we incorporated education, advanced screening, and heart health coaching um, in our uh, prevention. Our prevention program um, is called AIM to Prevent. A stands for assess. Um, I for intervene and M for manage. And if you look at the components of assessment, we have our advanced screening methodology as part of the assessment. Our intervention is based around lifestyle, essentially, exercise, diet, and rest. And that's what the topic of the uh, therapeutic lifestyle curriculum is all about. Uh, so far as medications are concerned, we do recommendations on medications, but we have your physician actually um, uh, drive uh, all the medical uh, checkups and, and, and testing and uh, medication. And finally, on the management side, uh, the key differentiator of our program has been heart health coaching, 
which now through studies that we are doing showing the benefits of actually sustained behavior change and reduction in risk factors. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Cesar Molina to you. Our topic today is on exercise is medicine. Dr. Molina um, has been to the Yale Medical School and has completed his MD thesis at Harvard Medical School um, and has done his cardiology and pharmacology fellowship at uh, Stanford School of Medicine. He's a cardiologist in the Bay Area at El Camino Hospital and has been the co-founder and medical director of the center. Uh, Dr. Molina has been, it's really fortunate for our community to get his expertise um, because he is well versed with the culture in Ayurveda uh, and in transcendental meditation. Uh, Dr. Molina is also the chair of the American Heart Association My Life Check of Silicon Valley. So Dr. Molina. So today's talk is uh, regarding or is today's uh, theme is part of our curriculum uh, of our, T our TLC curriculum, and we have created this guide to longevity and successful aging, um, and we do this through our lifestyle changes. Today we'll be talking about physical uh, activity, uh, exercise, and uh, longevity. Um, or therapeutic, therapeutic lifestyle changes curriculum uh, includes activity, exercise as medicine, nutrition. We have a lecture on the diner versus the dinner. And also we have a lecture on the importance of rest, meditation as medication, uh, or restful sleep and restful alertness. Um, the, in, the interesting thing about exercise is that um, we all assume that this exercise is of benefit to us, but we need to look at the science. And the science was not there until 1953 when in Lancet uh, the first paper was published uh, demonstrating the benefit uh, of physical activity in the prevention of cardiovascular disease and enhancing uh, the prognosis after a heart attack. Uh, the interesting thing is that most of the studies that were done initially on exercise were doing, done at the workplace. That is. There were in individuals who had very vigorous uh, work uh, schedules, uh, for example, a longshoreman uh, 50 years ago, um, and, uh, uh, or someone who was sort of uh, going up and down the flight of stairs. Many of the jobs now in the Western industrialized world are actually relatively sedentary, so we have moved from uh, work-based research studies to more uh, planned uh, exercise prescribed uh, uh, programs. Um, we'll, our, our lecture today will talk about the effect of um, exercise on inflammation and vascular physiology. We'll be talking about uh, how much to exercise, how often, how long, and when. Um, and we will look also at the relationship between our diet and exercise. Uh, and the effect of exercise not only on cardiovascular health, but on other aspects uh, of our uh, health. There is a continuum, and that is, these are, this is a slide showing that, uh, the different definitions uh, of what we mean by physical activity, exercise, and physical fitness. Ultimately, physical fitness is the most important predictor of survival, the most important predictor of longevity, um, and I'll show you the data uh, in the next uh, uh, slides. But physical activity is any body movement carried out by the skeletal muscle requiring energy. So just moving uh, is physical activity. Exercise is different from physical activity. It includes physical activity, but it's a planned structure, repetitive movement of the body designed to improve or maintain uh, physical uh, fitness. And physical fitness uh, is then defined as a set of attributes that allows the body to respond or to adapt to demands and stress of physical effort. So the word here, the word here is to respond or adapt. That is, the capacity of the physiology to change, to adapt to the requirements of the environment. In this case, the requirements for more physical effort. 
Now, where do we come, where does our curriculum come from? Our curriculum uh, arises from a paper that was published in 1980. Um, and this paper was the result of a 25-year study in which 7,000 individuals were followed and they were evaluated for successful aging. And in this case, success, successful aging means the capacity or ability to remain alive and to live in an autonomous, self-sufficient way that is able to take care of yourself, cook for yourself, shop for yourself, and live on your own, in your own home. So this Alameda study identifies seven factors. These seven factors in, uh, include adequate sleep, seven to eight hours per night, and that's the theme of a different talk uh, titled Restful Sleep and Restful Alertness. It also, one of those seven factors is regular vigorous physical activity that is burning about three kilocalories or three calories with a capital C per kilogram per day. So it's such that a 70 kilogram person would be burning 210 calories per day. Maintaining a recommended weight, not smoking, none or moderate alcohol consumption. You know, that means not having more than five alcoholic beverages per day. Eating breakfast daily and eating meals regularly and not snacking. Such that for a 45-year-old man with fewer than three of these habits, he is expected, at least in 1980, to live to the age of 67. Someone who has six to seven of these healthy habits is expected to live to the age of 78. Therefore, there is an 11-year difference. And that 11-year difference is key. And that is, as we go through our curriculum, you will realize that you can add or subtract 12 years to your life expectancy depending on how you live. Now, the next question is, can you turn the clock, meaning if you change your ways in midlife, do you still gain some benefit? And that study was published in 2007 in the archives of, in, the, in the American Journal of Medicine. And what was found was that individuals who change their lifestyle in midlife would actually enhance their longevity by a 40%, that is, they had a 40% reduction in all-cost mortality within, within, you know, four years. So it was very impressive. I don't have any pill that would do that for you. So the study went this way. 16,000 subjects were queried about four healthy habits, that is, a consumption of five or more fruits and vegetables per day, regular exercise, not being obese, that is, having a BMI between 18.5 to 29.9 kilograms per meter square, and not smoking. Unfortunately, in America, only about 8.5% of the population meets these four criteria. This is also very true in Europe. In Europe, they may be, there may be less obesity, but there is more smoking, such that you know, Europeans actually have actually found the same kind of distribution. So after counseling, uh, about 8.4% of those people who did not dis meet those four criteria were able to convert. And when compared, those who converted and had those four criteria versus those who did not have those four criteria, there was a 40% reduction in all-cause mortality, which is pretty impressive. Now, this is the first study I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, demonstrating the great uh, benefit of being physically active. Uh, and this study, again, was done in the workplace. And it was done in London, and it was done in a double-decker bus. The double-decker has two civil employees, uh, civil service employees. One is the driver, and the other one is the conductor. He goes up and down picking up the tickets. I always wonder where the name conductor came up because he was not conducting anything. He's just going up and down picking up the tickets. But what was found was that the drivers had about a two to three-fold higher incidence of heart attacks versus the conductors. These are individuals who have the same educational background, more or less the same diet, same income, but you can see very impressive slide here 
between the orange and the green that the drivers had a significant higher incidence of cardiovascular events versus the conductors. After a heart attack, the mortality rate within three days after the cardiovascular event was at least two times higher among the drivers versus the conductor. This was published in, in 1953 and was the first indication of the benefit of physical activity in the prevention of heart disease and in the enhancement of the prognosis after a heart attack. This is a study published from the Palo Alto VA Hospital looking at survival of individuals with different medical conditions such as hypertension, COPD, diabetes, obesity, and high cholesterol. And what was found was that the individuals who were the fittest, those who were able to exercise over eight metabolic units um, on a Bruce Protocol treadmill test had the best prognosis, that is they had the lowest relative risk of dying. The individuals who were the least fit, those who were not able to exercise beyond five metabolic units, in fact, here in the blue, you can see that they had the highest mortality. And this has been shown multiple times, that is, fitness is the most important predictor of survival, no matter what the underlying condition is. Now, let's just ask the question again, and that is, if you are unfit, do you gain any benefit from becoming fit? So that study was done by Blair, at that time at the Cooper Clinic in Texas. And he evaluated almost 10,000 men, and he performed an exercise stress test. So he separated them in individuals who were unfit um, in the first exercise stress test and unfit five years later on a second exercise stress test. He also found individuals who were fit on both exercise stress tests. And there were then, here in the middle, individuals who were initially unfit but subsequently became fit. And you can see that the mortality rate in this group was half the mortality rate of those individuals who were unfit on the first and on the second. So they were able to calculate that per every one minute that you improve on the exercise stress test, um, you actually enhance your longevity by 8%. That is for each minute increase in maximal treadmill time between examinations, Dr. Blair noted a corresponding 8% drop in mortality. Um, and this has been confirmed in other studies, particularly a Harvard study, in which they found that in individuals who burn 2,000 calories per week extra in exercise over the age of 74 had a significant 49% drop in cardiovascular and all-cause uh, all mortality. So the first studies that I show you were on men. How about women? And here in this slide, I'm showing you the data from two studies, the Nurses' Health Study and the Women's Health Initiative Observational Study. Um, and what you can see down here is that this is the actual uh, quantum of physical activity. So this... Um, women were separated on their basis of their physical activity into five groups. The individuals with the highest uh, physical activity had the lowest relative risk of having a cardiovascular event. Again, showing that the, the, the more physically active you are, the less likely you are of having a cardiovascular event. That is true even if you are obese. Looking at body mass index here, um, this is actually from the uh, nurses' study. They look at uh, a woman in these five different quantiles in individuals who were not obese versus individuals who were obese. And you can see that even in the obese group, there was a significant benefit from being physically active. The same is true if you have a family history of heart disease. If you have a family history of heart disease and you're physically active, you will see that you can drop your incidence of a cardiovascular event by 
in that group that is the most physically active. If you have no family history and you're physically active, you also gain a benefit. And smoking, again, if you actually are a smoker, you gain significant benefit and you have a drop between the, the, least, the least active versus the most active of about 32% if you're a current smoker. Obviously, those who never smoke are not the most physically active when compared to the non-physically active smokers. They had a 85% reduction in cardiovascular uh, events. So physical activity, and in this case, it was walking, benefits even the smoker. Now, the question is, can you alter the benefit that you obtain from being physically active? And this is actually an important question because it has been shown that people who tend to exercise many times will then become more sedentary throughout the rest of the day. And this study was done in India that I'm showing you here, but it has also been uh, shown here uh, in, um, in this country. And what was shown was that you can have a 50% reduction in the risk of heart disease with 35 to 40 minutes per day of brisk walking, as you can sort of see here. Individuals who were uh, physically, act physically active, they had actually a significant drop in cardiovascular events of about over 50% by uh, being uh, exercising 35 to 40 minutes per day, and in this case, brisk walking. However, if you add about 180, more than 180 minutes of sedentary activity, and in this case was watching television or watching a monitor, you can actually cut down that risk benefit by half. So the protective effect of leisure time exercise was most beneficial among those who had the least sedentary lifestyle. And having being physically active and having a very sedentary lifestyle unfortunately cuts the benefit of that physical activity in half. So let's just go over some quick facts. Question number one is, what's more effective, a home-based exercise program or a gym-based exercise program, when particularly when you're paying attention to weight loss? The fact is that a home-based exercise program tends to lead to more weight loss than a uh, gym-based exercise program. Exercise is not a very good technique for weight loss, and that is you need to cut down on your caloric intake because, again, people who uh, exercise tend to eat more to maintain their weight. So if you want to use exercise for weight reduction, then you also need to cut down consciously your caloric, your caloric intake. Another important fact is that the amount and not the intensity appears to be the most important for weight loss. That is, it doesn't matter if you run one mile or you walk one mile, you get the same benefit or caloric burn um, uh, in these two, you know, in, in those two, with these two activities. So it's the those who know physics knows that work equals distance, or distance equals work. Therefore, the amount of work or energy consumed is the same if you run one mile or if you walk one mile. However, if you walk one mile, you have less time to do other physical activities. The person who just runs one mile will do it in half the time of the guy who walked one mile, and therefore will have more time to be physically active in other activities. Um, the other thing is that when physicians prescribe exercise, it is better to prescribe short bursts of physical activity rather than long bursts of physical activity. That is, individuals who are advised to do about four 10-minute periods of exercise per day tend to exercise more than individuals who are advised to exercise 40 minutes per day. Um, and that's just, you know, for you to know. So this is, 
for you to remember as you're planning your exercise routine. And in this slide, it sort of shows me what we do when we go to the gym and we get to our physical trainer. So we pay our physical trainer five pebbles a session so that, uh, so that um, you know, we just, what we do is what we, what we could do ourselves. And that is, you know, swim around the tank or run around the, uh, run around on the treadmill or sort of push the same kind of weights. Sometimes it's good to do it in groups. Sometimes it's good to have a good motivator. But when you look at the science, the science indicates that a, a, a self-motivated home-based program tends to be more effective than an outside motivator going somewhere uh, program. Now, the next question becomes, when is the best time to exercise? And that has been studied. And the best time to exercise is actually about 12 hours before a heavy fat meal because that exercise will blunt the negative HDL and triglyceride effect of a heavy fat meal. So the effect on HDL is most pronounced, the beneficial effect of HDL is most pronounced when you eat when you exercise 12, min, 12 hours before a heavy fat meal. The effect on triglycerides, the benefit is if you exercise from 1 to 12 hours before. So that exercise primes your lipoprotein lipase. Exercise primes your metabolism and it helps you digest your food. So in America, if you're having the biggest meal of the day at dinner time in the evening, then exercising in the morning makes the most sense. Since, as you guys just mentioned, dinner tends to be the biggest meal of the day. Now, this is a great slide showing the HDL levels and triglyceride levels uh, in individuals who run. And you can see here the individuals with the highest HDL cholesterol were individuals who ran between 21 to 60 miles per week, the triglycerides were actually the lowest in individuals who ran 21 to 60 miles uh, uh, per week. But you can get some benefit, so you, can, you get some significant benefit if you run or walk seven, at least 7 to 10 miles uh, uh, per, um, uh, per week. So that's something to keep in mind, 10,000 steps per day. You get yourself a little nice fancy pedometer, and now they're available. They communicate with your computer. You put them on uh, uh, either uh, in your bra or on your belt, and they come in all nice, you know, fancy colors, very small clips. And, uh, you know, if you're a geek kind of person, you'll really enjoy sort of keeping track on your physical activity, how many steps you walk up a flight of stairs and how many miles you walk per day. And that's all available. The game plan is to at least... Uh, do 10,000 steps per day, that will take you to about 21 miles uh, per week. But you do gain some benefit if you do a little less. But the fact is that you get into trouble when you are very physically inactive. Now, the question again is, how frequently to exercise? Do you gain more benefit by more frequent exercise, even though you exercise less time during those episodes of exercise than if you do vigorous high intensity but less often exercise and that study has been done and published in 19 I think it was uh, uh, in circulation and what was found was that individuals and this is the HDL cholesterol this is a slide showing community change in HDL cholesterol individuals who had the highest rise in HDL cholesterol were those individuals who exercised five times and that five times for only 30 minutes, that is 150 minutes per week versus individuals who exercise 120 minutes per week at, uh, at either sort of higher intensity on a group base or high intensity on a home base. The home base, more frequent uh, le uh, and uh, less intense group, but doing 150 minutes versus 120 minutes had the greatest gain in the good HDL cholesterol.
Now, how about other lipoproteins? So HDL is one very important uh, protective lipoprotein, but how about the others, uh, such as LDL cholesterol? So we have shown that exercise can reduce triglycerides and increase HDL cholesterol, but it doesn't have any effect on total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol unless you change the composition of your diet. Now, the interesting thing is that in the past we had talked about the small particles of LDL. Those small particles of LDL tend to be more atherogenic. They tend to cause more arteriosclerosis. The interesting thing is that even though you don't observe a change on the LDL with more physical activity, if you look carefully, the size of those LDL particles will become bigger such that that level of LDL cholesterol become less heart disease promoting, less atherogenic. The good thing also is that the changes that you see in the HDL tend to be due to elevations in the HDL2B cholesterol, which tends to be the most cardioprotective. Now, moving right along, uh, let's talk a little bit about blood sugar because we have talked about the effect of, of exercise on, LDL, on HDL. We have talked about the effects of exercise on triglycerides. We have talked about the effects of exercise on the particle size of LDL cholesterol. But how about blood sugar? This slide is not about exercise. This slide talks about, demonstrates the effect of a, the predictive capacity of a two-hour glucose tolerance test upon the regression or progression of coronary artery disease. And that is individuals who are known to have coronary artery disease who have a perfectly normal two-hour glucose tolerance test with a blood sugar below 87 will in fact show regression of their narrowings of their coronary arteries as shown here in the green. Individuals who actually have high blood sugar uh, two hours after a glucose challenge would actually have progression and loss of lumen such that the response uh, of your physiology to a glucose challenge and your capacity to normalize your blood sugar tends to be predictive of what is going to happen to your coronary artery blockages. If you have a very normal process then those blockages will shrink. If you have an abnormal process, those blockages will progress. And this slide shows the effect of exercise on blood sugar. And you can see that the more you exercise, the percentage of waking hours spent in light intensity, and separated in quartiles, that is in four groups, they actually have the best response to a two-hour glucose tolerance test. So if you want to benefit from the slide that I just showed you before this one, if you want to be able to sort of regress arteriosclerosis, the game plan is to have a normalized glucose tolerance challenge test. And you can do that by being physically active as shown in this group who are the most physically active and who had the lowest blood sugar after a two-hour glucose challenge such that we can say that exercise is the non-insulin insulin. When you exercise, you actually prime your muscle to absorb blood sugar, that blood sugar, at a lower insulin level. Now, the effects of exercise on heart disease uh, are interesting because in the, uh, at the beginning, when I, st when I went to medical school and then I subsequently trained, there was this idea that coronary artery disease, the cause of heart attacks, was mainly just a plumbing issue. So you had a blockage, so you either bypassed the blockage or, the, or you blasted the blockage out of the way with a stent. But now we have learned that coronary arteriosclerosis is a diffuse condition. It's not a disease just of one blockage. It's a disease that is a generalized condition of poor vascular health. 
And the interesting thing is with this new paradigm is that we now understand that inflammation plays a very important role and that heart attacks are the uh, result of an inflammatory plaque that breaks and causes a clot. And the point that is brought in here is that exercise, being physically fit, plays a role here and has modulates the inflammatory response. So the benefits of exercise go beyond your triglycerides, go beyond, beyond your cholesterol, your, be, be, they go beyond your HDL cholesterol. Exercise has a beneficial effect on inflammation, it has an effect on stabilization of plaque, and it also has an effect on improved vascular function. Now, moving right along, this is an interesting slide because this slide um, refers to the interaction of exercise with food. In this case, fish oil. And you can see here in the black, this is a group of subjects who are uh, consuming six grams of fish oils and exercising versus another group that was just looking at, you know, having fish oil without exercise and then looking at another other groups who were consuming sunflower oil, not fish oil, with or without exercise. What they looked was a fat mass. The interesting thing was that the fat mass of individuals who were consuming fish oil and exercising was about two, two um, kilograms less. They had about 4.4 uh, pounds or 2 kilograms less of fat uh, if they actually consume fish oil and exercise. Why is that? Well, because the fish oils activate the enzyme that burns fat called lipoprotein lipase. And exercise also activates that enzyme. That activation is not seen with sunflower oil. Now, how about exercise and dementia? In fact, the best thing that you can do to prevent dementia is to be physically active and do aerobic exercise. So kids who are in school gain more for their brain by doing physical fitness class than studying history or chemistry uh, because we know that aerobic physical activity increases brain volume and particularly has an effect on the hippocampal area or on the hippocampus, which is the uh, area of the brain where memory is consolidated. So in this study that was done in New York, you can see that 65-year-old men and women who were free of dementia at the beginning of the study were separated in two groups. Those who uh, were exercising less than three times per week versus those who are exercising three or more times per week. And you can see here in the black line that there was a 38% reduction in the uh, onset of dementia. How about telomeres? How about what is the effect of exercise on your genetic material? Telomeres are the little caps at the end of your chromosomes and they help keep the chromosome healthy and they permit the cell to replicate by permitting the chromosomes to go through meiosis. And what you can see here is that in individuals who have heavy physical activity versus who those who were inactive had longer telomeres. So that this slide demonstrates that being physically active enhances your genetic material, enhances the capacity of your cells to stay healthy and to replicate. So exercise modulates many protective mechanisms, some of them by improving the lipid profile and glucose tolerance, reducing obesity and lowering blood pressure. But modification of just the cholesterol risk factors does not fully explain the benefits that have been observed from exercise. There's a positive effect of exercise on vascular function, autonomic tone, blood coagulation, inflammation, that, and these are, li are likely to contribute to improved cardiovascular health and survival, and possibly even more than the effect on cholesterol. So, do not get disappointed 
if you start exercising and you see no change in your cholesterol, because most probably there will be none, because we just talked, you know, discussed that exercise has very little effect on the total bad LDL cholesterol level. It just changes the particle sizes. But you gain some great benefit, and that great benefit goes beyond the measured cholesterol levels as described so far. So then the question is, what is the dose for regressional blockages? Well, that was studied and it was published in 1992. And the dose is uh, that it's about one hour of endurance exercise per day. That is seven days per week. Seven hours per week of endurance exercise to achieve an extra 2,600 calorie per week burn. And that has been shown to be a good dose for the regret to demonstrate regression of coronary artery disease. So, where to start and how to start? The easiest way is to exercise with walking. Walking requires very little equipment and tends to be the safest, particularly if you if you're looking where you're going. So before you, dis you dis start designing your exercise program, you need to ask yourself if you are the type of individual who needs clearance, that is medical clearance. So individuals who are high-risk individuals, for example, diabetics, people who actually have had a uh, long history of hypertension, significant obesity, they should see their doctors before starting a vigorous exercise program. There should be an assessment of your fitness. See where you are. Where are you beginning? And you should set yourself some realistic goals, things that you will do. It's important to develop a good, healthy, regular routine. You should include activities that develop um, the health-related components of physical fitness, but also it should be fun. Now, what you're trying to do when you're getting into an exercise program is what you're, you're trying to do is to place increasing amounts of stress on your body so that your physiology can adapt, and that adaptation is what leads to the improvement, improvement in fitness. So you pay attention to the frequency, so this is a fit principle, Frequency, that is how often are you going to exercise, how hard you're going to exercise, how long you're going to exercise for, and the type of activity. So that's, those four components are very important as you are designing your exercise program. Now, these issues of fitness are very easily reversible. That is difficult to gain and easy to lose. That if you stop exercising, um, that you lose about 50% of the benefit from a good exercise program within two months. So it's important to make exercise part of your regular routine, just like brushing your teeth and having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just like going to sleep and sleeping seven to eight hours a night. Fitness is the most important predictor of how well you're going to feel, how well you're going to age, and how long you're going to live. So there is a continuum on the benefits of physical activity. Too little, you gain very little. Too excessive, and you can get stress injury. So there is a sweet spot, and that sweet spot uh, is, can be seen in bicycling, walking, jogging, playing sports. Um, and then just being physically active during the day. Take the stairs, walk uh, as much as you can, park far away from the door at work and, and from, the, from, the, uh, from the store. Now, if you are unable to exercise, if for some reason you just hate it, then there is a trick. Get yourself a dog, particularly a terrier, because they can drive you crazy, because they want to go for their daily walk. What we mean by that is in Canada, they demonstrated 
that 67% of dog owners met the, their required 150 minutes per week of physical activity recommendation. So, if you can't exercise, if you hate exercising, if you cannot integrate it into your life, then get yourself a dog. You have two benefits. One, you'll be more physically active. And number two, there are some studies showing that dog ownership and animal uh, ownership is associated with enhanced longevity and improved quality of life. And this is not what you want to do, by the way. So the bottom line is, this is what we mean by therapeutic lifestyle changes. We mean physical activity, regular, vigorous, varied activity, walking 10,000 steps per day, exercising 150 minutes per week, frequent short bursts of physical activity, taking the stairs, walking as much as you can, and getting a little sweat once in a while. We mean paying attention to the nutrition. Through physical activity and rest, you work on the diner. Um, but you also need to pay attention to the diet, that is to the dinner. And you want to have more greens and less grains. You want to have four-fifths of veggies, 12 nuts per day, and absolutely no soda. Soda is poisonous. And rest, restful sleep, seven to eight hours per night, and the incorporation of restful alertness, and in this case, transcendental meditation, which has been shown in people with high-risk coronary artery disease on full medical therapy to decrease the incidence of death, stroke, or heart attack by about 47% within eight years. So here is actually what we offer at the South Asian Art Center, or aim to prevent program uh, is actually um, very inexpensive to you. Or, or services are at no charge. Or services are a gift of the South Asian community to the South Asian community and the hospital foundation to its uh, community. There is uh, a fee for the advanced laboratory screening that is done here at El Camino Hospital. And that is actually that, um, charged by the lab, not by the South Asian Heart Center. And individuals who have insurance, their maximum out-of-pocket expense averages about $59. This is for a $900 very comprehensive study. And we have been able to uh, obtain it for a $59 charge if you have insurance. That is part of the assessment. The intervention, that is this personalized risk report, results consultation, diet and nutrition counseling, rest and meditation counseling, exercise counseling, uh, is actually at no charge to you. And obviously, your medical care through your physician uh, has to be arranged with you, either pay your doctor or your insurance pays the doctor. And then the management, this heart health coaching for which the South Asian Heart Center is known. Uh, this heart health coaching is done face-to-face, -face, it's done by phone, by email, and again, there is no charge to that. At the end of our one year aim to prevent program, we actually uh, request that you get retested. And again, there's that $59 uh, charge. So how to get started? As a South Asian, you face a fourfold risk of heart disease, also an increased risk of diabetes. Heart attacks occur at a much younger age. So you, it's not something you say, okay, I'll wait until I get old. You need to start paying attention now. Your annual physical examination may underestimate your true risk. Therefore, it's important to pay attention to this advanced screening available to you through the Salvation Heart Center. And your heart health risks are better identified by advanced screening. And testing for emerging factors and additional risk factors that are not usually tested in most doctors' office. You can sign up with us. It's very easy. You can sign up, sign up at the South Asian Heart Center org dash get screen, and then it's sort of very easy, self-explanatory. You'll be told uh, how to sort of go, how the process works, 
and uh, you may benefit uh, from uh, our, uh, our program. So this is um, um, the end of our conversation on uh, physical uh, activity, uh, exercise, fitness, and longevity. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions online, um, and um, uh, if uh, there are no uh, if there are no questions, we'll uh, hopefully we'll see you again next month uh, when we talk uh, uh, on the, the continuing curriculum on therapeutic uh, lifestyle changes uh, on uh, November twenty first. So, um, uh, do we have any questions, Achich? So uh, have a good evening, and uh, we'll uh, talk again uh, next month. Bye-bye.